Hello, everyone. Hope you're having a great uh, Friday. Um, some people afternoon for us here in California. Rob and I, it's uh, mid-morning. Rob, how are we doing? Doing good. Good, great. Hey, uh, thanks for everyone coming in. Um, I'm really excited to have Rob here. Uh, really talk about just the market. Um, there's been a lot of wild, crazy changes that have been taking place. And I want to just kind of go over what's taking our, uh, place with the market and just a little update. And before we get into that, just want to go through just uh, briefly, you know, who Incelerate is. Uh, you know, we're uh, in the business of helping lenders close more loans. Um, we work nationwide with a lot of large lenders, banks, credit unions, um, you name it. We have uh, a lot of uh, marquee companies. We have a lot of great technology. One of the things about Incelerate, I think that it stands out is our um, software is new and it's uh, highly integratable. So we have lots of integrations. We really help lenders with uh, their, their backend platform. And then we really, just so everyone knows, we have two core products. We have our CRM lead management system that has a mobile and a desktop application. Then we have our CRM and uh, engagement platform. Um, and engagement is uh, automated emails, text messages, ringless voicemail, Facebook posts, direct mail, phone calls. And we provide uh, strategy and all the content. So not only does our system help you manage our transactions with consumers and talk about a time right now, if you're ever wanting to make sure you're staying engaged with your customers and staying in contact with them, now is the time to do it. Um, so we help you with that. And we provide the strategy, the content, the technology to do that. So that's the brief shameless plug for Incelerate. Um, <laughs> what I want to get into, Rob, is I think the last time we spoke, the market was really, uh, the, the, the MBS prices had been crazy. We were having 150 basis point day swings. And I actually have this chart from just last week to show kind of where the market's been going over the last several weeks. But the market's really stabilized, hasn't it, as far as pricing from the MBS securities, right? It has, indeed, which is a good thing. We knew it would. Uh, it was just a matter of when. And I think with the Fed stepping in some weeks ago and calmer heads prevailing, yeah, certainly things have, th things have calmed down. Volatility doesn't do anybody any good whatsoever. Yeah. So. And then, so, so some people know this, um, and there's a lot of people out here that I think we had over 500 people last time, uh, plus that watched this webinar, and I think this time is going to be no shortage of that as well. Um, just briefly, so those people that know or don't know, um, why did the rates stabilize, and what did the Fed program, what did they do to make that happen? Well, it's it's uh, it, it's been a very interesting time to be a loan originator because. <clears throat> So many people are getting great lessons in supply and demand uh, over the last couple of months. And, and as you might recall, a year ago, we went into 2019 thinking rates were going to go up and everybody was, was, you know, just in a terrible mood. And they were talking about cutbacks and they were talking about, you know, adding business channels and scaling back, blah, blah, blah. And uh, rates did not go up. In fact, they went down. And we, as we headed into 2020, we saw rates go even lower and these huge pipelines well up. Uh, unfortunately, most of them are were refinanced or still are refinanced. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, nobody foresaw kind of that happening. And then we got hit by the pandemic, which uh, has driven rates down further. And, you know, you have to be careful what you wish for because, uh, you know, I would, I would talk to originators and they would say, oh, <clears throat> You know, I had all my money in uh, Nat City, or I had all my, my retirement plan was in WAMU and Countrywide, whatever, and I got wiped out, and I just need, like, one more refi boom to get it back on my feet to, you know, help help my retirement plan. Well, they've got it uh, in spades, I'll tell you. So with the pandemic, of course, that has impacted every economy in the world uh, and not positively. And so what has happened is, the the suddenness of what has happened has been what 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 is amazing because if you go back to 2008 2006 2010 you know those things took months and months and months uh these you know we're we've been at this for like six weeks seven weeks it's been an amazing change and the volatility has not as i said helped anyone the, the rate environment is such that there's at this point, there's no real reason for rates to go up at all, really. We so we could be in this rate environment for quite some time. But I think it's important for people to remember when we talk about rates, <clears throat> it used to be a much easier thing to talk about rates because all the rates kind of move the same. You know, the 10-year would do this and the 
the 30-year mortgage rates would do that, and the rate sheet would re react accordingly. But there were two or three weeks there, especially in the second half of March, first week of April, where the treasury market would be up and mortgage prices would be down and rate sheets would do whatever rate sheets were going to do or vice versa. I mean, there was no rhyme or reason. And a lot of that comes down to supply and demand, as I mentioned earlier, because you have and had then and will continue to have lenders who are pricing their rate sheets based on capacity. They don't care if the 10 year you know, rallied to half a point and they don't care that mortgages, the mortgage backed securities improved, you know, by a quarter of a point. If they need to slow capacity down, the quickest and easiest way to do that is price in the margin. So they may leave their rate sheets unchanged, even though we're having a big rally in the bond market. So I ended up getting a lot of loan officer emails saying, what the heck? You know, the, the, I hear the MBS market is better by half a point, but we didn't move our rate sheets and, and, you know, what's going on here? And I'll write back, well, are, is your pipeline full? Yeah, you know, I'm having a great, you know, great month, great March, great April, blah, blah, blah. I can't, you know, I can't turn the business off. Well, then what difference does it make? What, what uh, you know, if the, if the rate sheet didn't move because the business continues to flow through the door. And so when we talk about rates, it's not so much, or at least there for two or three weeks, it was a different environment. Everything was moving differently. Now, things have stabilized, to your point. Things have, things have calmed down, the volatility. Uh, in fact, this week has been a, been a nice week for, for lack of volatility yeah. to help move some of these loans through the pipeline without having to renegotiate or, or have them fall out. Uh, margin calls have died down. In fact, a lot of the margin calls have been paid off. Now, companies are looking ahead to May pair offs, unfortunately. But the but the rate volatility has slowed down, and I think that basically helps everybody in the business. No, no doubt. Well, you know, it's something you said at the beginning too, which was with the rates and the stabilization, which was and the change was. I remember 2007, 2008, 2009. That was like a a slow deflation of a balloon over like a year, like or a year and a half. It's this program changed, and then four weeks later something happened in the marketplace, and four weeks later something happened in the marketplace. You're right. In the last six weeks, we've had I mean, what, Wells Fargo just came out. And I think there's jumbos out of the market, non qms out of the market. Wells Fargo's not buying a, under 680. They're no longer buying cash out loans, from what I understand that that came out yesterday as well. Um, you have other lenders who are, are you know, are not buying um, government loans, service and values is, you know, that's a whole new thing that's becoming an, an issue. This is has changed quickly as far as product. Um, and I want to talk about service and values because, you know, I think that's. Uh, Important. It's not only important to understand, but I think as an um, industry right now, we need to be speaking up to our our Congress and to and to people in the in power. When Mark Calabria said yesterday, came out and they're not going to help servicers with these loans. They're not going to. They're not going to advance any services with any additional funds to, to help with this liquidity crunch. You know, Jenny Mae is, but they're you know FH, FHFA is not. Um, so explain why is. The service and value of a loan and an interest rate, right? There's the price and then there's the value to service it, and that affects the price to the street of a rate. And right now, that's a massive change. And and what's happening to servicers right now in this market because of that? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's crazy out there. I, I think that uh, it's important to remember that that a a rate sheet price, and I don't even know if anybody sends out a rate sheet per se anymore. I think they do, but you know, I, we call it a rate sheet price, pricing yeah. engine, whatever you want to call it. The price that that is being quoted to the borrower is a factor of many different things. It's a it's a component of the mortgage-backed security price that if that loan was going into a mortgage-backed security, it is a function of how much profit margin the company needs to just keep keep the doors open and to uh, put aside reserves for future buybacks. So there's corporate profit in there. There's overhead. You know, is it a is it a grand space on uh, you know Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles or is it you know out in Elko, Nevada, some little you know neck in the strip mall wedged between the 7-Eleven and a vape shop. You know, it depends. You know, the, the office space matters, uh, but it also includes the value of servicing because someone somewhere will pay in theory for that 
servicing cash flow. And by the servicing cash flow, once again, it's not necessarily necessarily the owner of the mortgage-backed security that is servicing the loan. The servicer might be Chase or Wells or Penny Mac or whoever who collects that monthly payment from the borrower and then forwards on most of it to the actual investor and the actual investor might be some pension fund in, in Ecuador or might be a money manager and you know in, in London. I mean you know, yeah the mortgage back security is probably so. different. What's yeah. that? Features credit unions, buy them or whatever. Or, or the Federal Reserve, right? That's right. The Federal yeah. Reserve. That's yeah. right. So so the servicer gets in a check for $2,000 for the monthly payment and sends on 1,990 of it and keeps $10 a month for that loan uh, multiplied by all these loans and there's a cash flow and so there's a value associated with that cash flow. So it's easy to talk about the mortgage-backed security market. Oh, you know, bonds did this and that and the other thing. It's easy to talk about overhead. It's easy to talk about profit margin. It's easy to talk about buy-ups and buy-downs, loan level price adjustments, whatever, or where you want to be competitively uh, uh, in the marketplace. But the value of servicing <laughs> is a little bit obtuse, a little bit foggy. And I think that when a originator sees a price on the rate sheet, all of those factors go into that price that they're quoting that borrower. So the, that servicing has value. Well, the issue is that once again, you have let's say let's say Chase collects the payment from the from the borrower, sends on most of it to the investor, and keeps the money for themselves. If that borrower doesn't send Chase that money, that monthly payment, but Chase still has to send the investor right. that money that they're due because they bought that security, then Chase has a problem. You know, Chase has a problem. They didn't get the two thousand dollars to send on the nineteen hundred and ninety of it and keep the ten. They didn't get the two thousand. They still owe the nineteen ninety. What are they going to do? And so, when you have the government come out with a forbearance program to say, okay, those borrowers don't have to send Chase and every other servicer money that two thousand yeah. dollars, but for many programs, Chase still owes it to the investor. Then Chase is stuck. And that especially hits independent mortgage bankers who are servicing loans. I, I'm not going to pick on anybody, but normally, what when you talk about independent mortgage banks who are big servicers, you're talking about you know Mr. Cooper or Freedom or Loan Depot or you know Quicken, United Shore, United Wholesale, and so forth. A lot of transactions, a lot of servicing, a lot of moving parts. And if they aren't getting the money from the borrowers based on the Care Act, CARES Act, then they're still on the hook. And so the value of that servicing, that cash flow, suddenly the cash flow stops for some period of time, whether it's three months, six months, or a year, that cash flow stops. The value of that cash flow basically goes to zero. Arguably it can go negative because, right. you know, uh, you know, Josh right. and Rob's you mortgage. Them. That's right. What's that? We have to front the money. So it, it, it's, it's, it's worthless. Yeah. It's, it, we're, 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 we're out. That's right. And, and and Josh and Rob's mortgage, if we only have five million bucks in the bank and we're servicing, you know, a hundred million dollars or something, and uh and we still owe the investors their money every month, that, that's gonna chew up our five million dollars of capital very right. quickly. We can't use it for warehouse, we can't use it for all kinds of things to, to make payroll. And so the, the value of servicing, which gets included in the borrower's rate sheet, has been all over the map, depending on the latest news from the Federal Reserve, from the FHFA, from Congress, and so forth. So it's been, like I say, it's been a wacky, you know, last, you know, three to four weeks in terms of servicing values that are still going all over the map. Yeah, no, and, I, and we have been seeing, I want to kind of, you know, in this, um, I think there's been a lot of people in our industry speaking out about this, right? Um, I was listening to Kevin Perano, uh, uh post from last night, KP, Good job on talking about, you know, uh, you know, the FHA FA has, they have a $225 billion warehouse line from the feds that they could use to actually front servicers. I think, I think the numbers from between 25 to $75 billion is what this is going to cost servicers over the next period of time. And they, you know, we could front that money and could make it actually smooth over for servicers. So there's not a disruption in the marketplace. Jenny May is doing that, but you know, we're, we're not doing it in other places. So it would be good. You know, I just, those are listening 
if you do get aren't involved, if you get involved, reach out to your congressman, your senator and say, hey, pay attention to what's going on in the mortgage industry. There's a lot of people talking about this because we have to realize our industry is what has draw has brought this our country out of a recession multiple times. And if you really look at, you know, the consumer spend and consumer equity, you know, I uh, heard 17 trillion dollars in current equity in homes in America. That's mass. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, that's a lot of just, let's just say that's the equity and people take out equity. And what do they do when they do that? They buy things, they remodel, they spur the economy, they send their kids to college, they pay for weddings, they take vacations to Europe. They've always wanted to take, they buy a motor home and us keeping this market moving is very important for our industry because this is what really drives the American, you know, let's say the American dream. If you look at the numbers, Home equity value and consumer spending typically go hand in hand. When home values and consumer equity goes down, consumer spending goes down, usually by about the same number over the last 20 years. They're very, very tied hand to hand together. So it is important that we do get our representatives to kind of step in and say, let's see how we can really you know, adjust this. Now, something you said, which I think is exciting, you know, in a time like this, <clears throat> you know, some lenders are hurting, right? Because they, they're, they're hurting because of the service and the margin calls. Um, and maybe because they're not adjusting their business models. Now I can say at the other side of the fence, we have lenders. I mean, I, I talked to a, a, one of my lenders uh, yesterday, they're a bank and they have 11 loan officers and they funded $107 million for the 11 loan officers last month. And they're gonna be funding over hundred million a month with 11 people. I mean, that's, they're, you know, they're usually averaging like 5 million a month per loan officer. They're unbelievably hyper-efficient um, as a call center. Um, and I like to say they use great technology. They've been they've been using our software for over three years. So you know, and by the way, I just looked at yesterday, um, four or five of the top 100 originators in America use our software. So it's currently really? it's yes. So four, I'll get the list out to everyone. But four or five of the top 10 use our software, and another I think 20 or 30 of the top 100 use our software. So well, congratulations of, on that. Thank you. And these are and, and these are loan officers, by the way, with no assistance. These aren't retail loan officers that have teams. These are single people sitting at a desk selling loans and just crushing it. So we have lenders that are just absolutely killing it right now because they've adjusted to the market. And you can probably give the news that people haven't heard this. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac after 2019 said 2020 was going to be a down year, right? We're going to be less, less volume. 2020, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Rob, what did they just come out and say recently? It's going to be a... That's going to be another banner year. Banner year. That's right. I I, I lose track of I lose track of the the estimates and the forecasts and so forth. The, the NBA is 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 very good humored about always being wrong, uh, but they get close. I mean, they revise it all the time, which is good. But yeah, it's just going to be another great year. The, right. the issue, of course, is is trying to do you know five trillion dollars of, of mortgages through an industry built on doing you know a trillion and a half, two trillion. And doing all five trillion in the next two or three months. I mean, that's that's the problem. That's so, right. and I think so. That was something that um, when we we're going into this, and I was talking to our lenders because you know we, we always obviously want to go out there into the market and understand are people afraid of what's taking place? Are they excited? You know, I had a, a, one of our lenders who, you know, uh, as soon as the shutdown started happening, they hearing about it, like in the middle of, uh, end of January, he was planning on hiring you know fifty to hundred new originators this year. He went ahead and went out there and pre-bought all the equipment, put it all in order because he knew it would be hard to get that equipment in once this all took place. He he high, he bought ahead of time. And they're all they're they're actually the ones that have the top producers uh, in America that work for them. And they're you know they're crushing it. And so they've bought ahead of the time because they saw this opportunity that the market's going to be better. And by the way, I will say at least with the with Fannie and Freddie and their estimations, they're better than the weather men. And the, or the weather people, right? We <laughs> I, we can't predict the weather very much. So I mean, we you know at least we have some better predictions when it comes to our, you know our our volume. So those lenders out there, um, let's talk about the volume. Uh, I think it was we talked about a month ago, and the estimates were between seven and a half trillion. I mean, depends on who was talking. It was seven and a half trillion. Some people said five trillion. Some said eleven trillion of refinanceable loans that were in the money, and that's not purchase transactions. That's just rate and turn of refinanceable loans. That's not cash out transactions. And then the market changed and said, well, you know, the government lending is not there as much. There's not as much FHA or VA business, but, um, you know, is this really a good market? And I kind of did the math and said, well, listen, if it, the number was say 10 trillion, 
let's say if you knocked off people under 680 from the VA pool and so forth, let's say the number's now 6 trillion. Well, we as an industry, I mean, what was our record? 2 trillion or 2.2 trillion, I think, was that? And It was over 2 trillion somewhere. Yeah. yeah, so we couldn't even, even if you cut out that 10 trillion went to 5 trillion, we couldn't even as an industry touch it in a year. Like we would, we you know, now maybe with technology, this year will be a year that people can start really ramping up some production. But, it, you know, we have um, an opportunity right now. I think that's what's really impactful is there's such an opportunity out there right now that those lenders who are adjusting in real time, right? You know, Rob, you've been in this business for a long time. I've been in this business for a long time. Um, I think part of the message is for some of the people that have been in this business for a long time, if you're not adapting in this marketplace, it's going to be a challenge, right? You know, this, the, the same old way you did business. I mean, I, you can't go shake someone's hand right now and, and bring them cookies at their open house anymore. Like no, that. You know, I mean, the, the, like the best you can do is like is, is like look into their eyes, uh, you know, via Zoom. Zoom or WebEx or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a, right. different, it's a different world. That's right. I mean, I, yeah, that's right. It's a, it, it is a different world. So we're seeing some of the lenders that are, are retail lenders who are, they're, they're, they're some of the loan officers are like, they're struggling because they don't know what to do because they can't go out there and they're not farming business anymore. And then some of those retail lenders are saying, well, let's push leads. Let's buy some leads. Let's feed these people because there's still people out there. And, or let's automate our, our service or transaction or portfolio or all of our past customers. And let's sell refinances right now because our people could do the refinances. So I think that's like the key thing, right, is get stuck. You're in the business. You know, I always said in the mortgage business, we're in the, in the business of helping people with their financial future. So whether that's a first mortgage or a second mortgage or a refinance or a purchase transaction or reverse mortgage, it's using a, a debt in their home to help build a financial future. So if lenders look at that and adjust, they could adjust to selling refinances, which we obviously know there's more than we can shake a stick at right now. Right? There's tons of business out there. And you know, I think what's important for lenders right now, more so than six months ago, Everything qualified. I was having I was having a conversation with um, a, a friend of mine who was actually my first business partner in my first mortgage company 18 years ago, and he's been out of business for some time now. And we were talking and we we're discussing what happened after the market meltdown and non-QM, you know, the term non-QM subprime, whatever you want to call it, was gone. And then you know, uh, guidelines for FHA loans were 680. Everything was high. And over the last 10 years, what we got all this back. We got, you know, FICOs where people are lending down in 600 again. We had non-QM. Then all of a sudden, in like a day, it disappeared, basically. So those lenders who are paying attention and really, like, diving into the data, look at your portfolio, look at the past closed loans you have, understand who they are, what interest rates they're at, what type of programs they're at, what their lifestyle may be today. And you can say, all right, here's the pool that I can spend my time on this 50% of the pool to go after. And this 50% is... I don't want to go after because I can't maybe help them, but this 50%, they're all on the money and really fine tune their market and their efforts and their and and train their team on guidelines of hey, what can be done and how to kind of go after the marketplace. We see that this is a great, um, you know, a really great uh, 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 time for people to grow. Um, what, you know, what are you seeing out there, lenders, um, you know, any other adjustments, any other major announcements that you've seen come out over the last, uh, week or two or anything you're, you're expecting coming up we should be paying attention to you know um for for a while there it seemed like we were getting multiple big announcements uh every day uh for for a week or two and i i, I don't know how people kept kept track uh when you've got you know wells saying this and amerihome saying that and chase saying this and penny mac and and the, the you know 100 correspondent investors not to mention all the wholesale lenders with freedom and united wholesale loan deep coming out with announcements like like every day almost it was very very difficult to keep track that has slowed down quite a bit and that which is a good thing i think the uh the, the five point hit or the seven point hit that has been put out by the fhfa you mentioned yeah. uh, on uh, cash out refis and so forth five point hit on first time home buyers Really, uh, certainly that first time home buyer hit uh, kind of pushes people towards the FHA DA program, which are tailored arguably more towards first time home buyers. But Wells Fargo coming out yesterday and saying, all right, 
FHFA, if, if we're going to get charged by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac uh, seven points uh, to do a, you know, a, a cash out refi, uh, uh, you know, whether or not it is in forbearance, that really turns some heads. Yeah. And I think it'll be interesting to see what other major investors do. No, no investor wants to be the last one standing when it comes to non-QM or jumbo. Yeah. Um, especially on a, on a big scale. And so with Wells making that move, I think that that, I think, I think investor, other investors and lenders are taking a look at that and saying, okay, now what do we do? How do we price? How do we, how do we price for that risk? Because it all comes down to what the borrower is going to have to pay because you, you can't ask lenders, you can't ask Josh and Rob's mortgage to take a seven point hit on a cash out. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not going to sell it to Wells Fargo. So let's sell it to Chase or let's sell it somewhere else. Oh, wait a minute. Everyone's going to start charging that. So then you're left with, are, am I going to charge the, uh, uh, you know, am I going to charge the borrower for a cash out refi seven points? Now, to their credit, I shouldn't even say to their credit, but, but we knew that uh, the director of the FHFA was inclined to lessen their footprint to scale things back uh do is it really in fannie mae or freddie max charter to encourage non-owner occupied loans is it in their charter to encourage cash out refis and so you know you never want to waste a crisis right and so i think what uh, the director has done is use this as an excuse to bring back to scale in fannie mae and freddie max footprint uh, which he's which he's talked about for quite some time. So he's he's doing kind of what might be expected of him. That doesn't mean the industry and a lot of people in the industry has to like it. In fact, we don't. It doesn't mean that people who want cash out refis have to like it. They don't. But it's but it's what kind of what was expected. Um, that may or may not change. We'll see. But as I said earlier, the the quickest way. Like on a rate sheet, if you're a company who has too much capacity coming in, the quickest way to slow down the capacity is to, you know, raise your margins, you know, make your prices worse. Well, the same with the agencies, the same with anything, same with gasoline, same with furniture, same with upholstery, sure. whatever. You want to slow things down, raise your price, increase your margins, and that'll slow things down in a hurry. And with that announcement, you, you can be guaranteed that'll slow things down, especially when it turns to cash out refis. With regard to some of the other things that are going on out there, most of what we are seeing, or most of what we're seeing from investors are investors, they were in that scramble mode a few weeks ago. You know, they, we couldn't keep up with all the announcements coming out. Now things have slowed down. Now investors and lenders are taking a, probably a, a harder look at, at risk. You know, how should they price risk appropriately? Servicing values, how do they, how do they incorporate those into the rate sheet when they're when they're zero? You know, I'll tell you, there's some great deals being picked up right now um, on servicing. You know, it's not worth zero. Um, That's right. But 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 that aside, and I think that that the industry to some extent is kind of taking a breath right now and evaluating the risk, evaluating what's happened over the last few weeks, evaluating the the FHFA announcements regarding servicing and with regard to first time home buyers and cash out refis this week and just taking a breath and trying to figure out where they want to go and how they want to price that all appropriately. So I would expect we'll continue to see announcements uh, with regard to not so much getting out of programs, but, but tweaking the guidelines or tweaking the pricing, a loan level price adjustments. I think we'll see a lot of that coming up in, in the next few weeks. That's good. You know, something you said, which was, um, well, by the way, for all those that are out there listening, we are going to start taking questions. I think there's a box you can enter questions in. Um, and if you want to put questions in, I will. Uh, well, actually, I do have questions in here now. Let me see if I can find, pull them down. But um, one of the things that you said was, uh, I think is 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 true or was interesting is they, uh, the government, well, there's been this um, debate of whether or not Fannie, Freddie, and, and we should be, it should be fully privatized, not privatized. Should we be a bigger footprint, smaller footprint, you know, and so forth and so on. And so what I think is a challenge though, is 
how do you shrink a footprint in a market that all the non-government players just pulled out of? Like, it's not really the time to try to shrink your footprint if there's no other, there's no one else out in the market to sell to. I think uh, someone said, well, tell them to sell to another agency was a quote from yesterday from the FHFA. And I think the response was, well, there is no other agency. Where do you sell these loans? So this is probably, I get, and, and maybe this isn't the time, and this is why I, was, I would challenge our, our politicians and people in power. This maybe isn't the time to, to push that agenda of we think we should shrink the government involvement in the mortgage market and, and we should you know lower our footprint. I think that this isn't probably, probably the time to make those adjustments because it's, as you, like you said, it's, it's, a, it's affecting people. I mean, if, if cash out right now, it is, and it's not, and we just think about it, it's cash out for people. It's a good thing for our economy. And, and, and think about this. You know, I was actually, uh, my son, I think I've talked about it. He's, he's working at my house. He's a loan officer. Uh, he started his first day, got licensed and got his license all dropped. The first day he was on quarantine at home. So he's been for, having a hard time with training and, you know, and the company works for, they're great, but he hasn't had any managers, anyone there just kind of, you know, be right on top of him. So I was, you know, going over a, a loan file with him and he had a customer call him in and he can only lower the customer's interest rate by like an eighth of a percent. There's the cat. And he can only lower the interest rate by, <laughs> by an eighth. Of a I saw the dog in the back window earlier too, or, or a coyote. One of the two. <laughs> <laughs> Someone was back there moving around. <laughs> said lowered by he got a lower person's interest rate by like an eighth of a percent. And couldn't really save him much money. And I said, but whoa, whoa, Tristan, let's look at this. So yeah, the guy's got like sixty-seven thousand dollars in credit card debt. I'm like, he has sixty-seven thousand credit card debt. Yeah, he's a dentist. He just has a bunch of credit card debt. Well, how much equity does he have? Well, I can give him cash out like thirty grand. I said, well, show them how to save him money. Because of thirty thousand dollars in credit card debt that you're paying, even if you got great credit and you're paying twelve percent, twelve percent compounded daily interest is exorbitant interest rate, right? If you really think about it, versus a mortgage at three, even if the mortgage is five percent simple interest, the the mathematical savings that if people were to actually restructure their their debt and put it into your home, which is thirty years simple interest, lowest interest rate you can possibly get, and tax deductible depending on how you how it all works right you can talk to your accountant on that one like why wouldn't we encourage america to like lower their overall payments and lower their debt loads and and you know i just you know that i'm i'm hoping that we as an industry kind of you know rally behind that and you know the people the powers that be will listen to that because it's something that we do need right we do need to get back to that uh, place in market um, right yeah, i mean it's like it's like a, it's a loan officer 1a 101, loan officer 101, you know, what is your debt? Oh, well, you know, here are rates and here's what we can do. And that's right. Voila. That, yeah, that, that's right. It's what's your debt. That, that's the whole point. It's what's your overall debt. And this is your financial picture. And I always, I advocate that the average American is not getting financial help from really anyone. If you think about it, financial planners, really good financial planners, the top ones in the world, you have to have millions of dollars for them to sit down and work with you. Right? I'm not saying that you know there's not other good financial planners, but if you're going to get someone that's going to really dive into and really help you, they, you have to have a lot. They got to make money off of you. And the advice we get from financial planners, from CPAs, no one's actually hopping into. Um, I've never had a CPA or financial planner look at my credit report and say, "Here's all your debts. Here's your income. Here's your DTI, and here's how to structure a financial plan." For you. I've never had anyone actually. I've had them say, "Buy these stocks or buy this life insurance." Because you want to retire with this much money, but not here's your daily life and where's where you're spending money and here's how you structure your debt. So I mean, really, I do think you know, the mortgage industry and loan officers are really put in a in a place to really help consumers with that you know transaction. So I feel you know really excited about that. Um, I do have some questions here coming in. Uh, you know, mortgage bankers push government loans because of the higher value. One was I heard the government servicers are getting the help they need from Jenny May. Why don't mortgage bankers push government loans because of the higher valued SRPs? Um, I think maybe the question is why aren't lenders pushing more government loans? Well, I think maybe the lenders aren't pushing more government loans is probably because if it's someone could qualify for a conventional loan, why would you have them pay mortgage insurance? Right? I think that's probably the the, the, the bigger yeah. answer. But I think but I think the <clears throat> there's a, a perceived difference in in getting back to our earlier discussion about the value of servicing and what is the value of servicing worth for a Fannie Mae loan or a Freddie Mac loan or a non-QM loan or a FHA loan or a VA loan. Uh, and then you get into a discussion about scheduled, scheduled versus actual, actual or scheduled, actual 
you know, what what are you scheduled to provide the the investor versus what you actually receive from the borrower every month? And and so the the as I said, the the, the value of servicing fluctu has fluctuated wildly. Uh, once again, it's been a lesson for everybody in the in the in the industry about the value of servicing and how that impacts rate sheets. And there are some institutions right now who I think we'll look back on this time and say they were very, very smart because they were able to take advantage of some of the inefficiencies that are in the market right now. Is Ginnie Mae servicing really worth zero? Well, I'm going to say probably not, especially if you're a bank. So if you're a bank and can buy it at zero, why not? So what has happened is, if you think about the market, you've got the aggregators, Wells, City, Chase, B of A, not B of A, sorry, Wells, City, Chase, Marihome, Penny Mac, and you've got the agencies. And if you're Wells Fargo and you can buy Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac servicing at zero or FHA VA servicing at zero buy and hold on to it and have the financial you know, strength to hold on to that, <clears throat> that's a great thing. However, small independent mortgage banks don't always have the luxury of either holding on to the servicing or picking exactly who they sell loans to. So what we've seen here in recent weeks is a tremendous number of independent mortgage banks who are now selling conventional loans to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, especially the Fannie Mae cash window, yep. because A, they get paid pretty quickly, but B, the servicing, they can sell the servicing off to in a, in a co-issue deal or uh, sell it to a buyer of servicing rather than sell it to the aggregators because right now the aggregators bid for servicing is really poor. So companies that have the ability to hold on to servicing and can sell to the Fannie Mae cash window, retain the servicing, perhaps sell it later, have a big advantage over companies that can't, they, that, that have to sell the servicing to whoever they're approved with. So, yeah. and, and we're seeing that price difference now on rate sheets. Well, you said it's, it's, it's kind of the market like uh, supply and demand, right? So it, 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 it's, and, and it's kind of reminds me of oil. When oil is, you know, negative $30 a gallon, what that, what, that, what that was really saying was we have capacity. We got to keep pumping oil. We can't shut these pipes down. We got to get, you know, so those oil companies, you know, if, heck, if you had a bunch of oil tankers that were just sitting around, hey, go fill those puppies up. If you had capacity to hold it and then push it out into the marketplace at a later date, you're going to make money off of it. Same with servicers right now. Like, I, you're right. If you, these aggregators, if you know, if they had the wherewithal and they're able to maintain the financial stress of having to carry some of the service in, why we're going through this this transaction, this difference, yeah, they're going to be picking up huge values. They're going to come out of this in a year, rates are going to up a little bit, and they're going to have service and values that are just massive because you're going to have loans that, you know, 3% that the, that the expectation of those that are going to run off anytime soon are very low, right? The prepay value is going to be very, very low on those people. You're going to be able to get, you know, high, high values for service and value. A couple other questions. Um, HA loans offer loans that cannot be approved. There's a group of questions here. Uh, as a loan officer, I need all the basic loan types to sell. I don't like the company side what loans I should sell. I don't want to leave the buyers high and dry. Offering better pricing for purchase is what we should do. Uh, that's a comment. Um, trying to get through this feed here. V loans, specifically SRP, FHA loans, offer loans that cannot be approved on the conventional side. I think most of these are comments, not necessarily questions. Um, uh, I, you know, a lot, I still a lot of questions about servicing and loan products, which I think is what we just kind of really talked about, which is really it's going to come down to, I think it's going to be um, lender by lender right now. So some of these lenders, to your point, so some lenders, you know, I, I just saw recently in the last um, month, I had a few of my friends come out, to reach out to me and say, hey, Josh, you know, any, lend any lenders that have their tickets? Because right now, all of a sudden, if you have your Fannie Freddie ticket, you're like, you know, I actually had, a, had someone that was in the middle of a transaction, was closing on a company supposed to close not too long ago and they had their Fannie Freddie tickets and he called me and said you know over the weekend and he was pissed he's like gosh dang it my deal blew up I said why he goes well because now they want more money they called me back and said we're the prettiest we're the prettiest girl at the dance everyone's calling us we have our Fannie Freddie tickets and that and that's because of the cash window right because that's because you're able to go to the cash window sell it and then 
Yeah, yeah especially and especially the Ginny May, the, the, the ability to issue Ginny May securities is very uh, highly sought after in this market. Yeah, yeah. So those lenders out there, if you work for a company that has a Jenny, Fannie, Fannie or Freddie ticket, you're in a nice, that's a, that's a nice place to be because you have the ability, when, you know, three weeks ago, if you looked at the Fannie, the, the price and what people were paying, I mean, there, there had to be six, seven, eight hundred basis points between the price and, and the, the security price and what people were getting on the street from rate sheets. It was a, there was a massive amount of uh, margin in there. So those lenders that have that are probably doing a really good job right now. Um, yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of different questions. You know, a lot of people are really interested about the government loans and why we're not getting more into the government business, which I, I do agree. Um, government loans have definitely helped out. I mean, actually, think about it. Before 2008, this whole government business was, we didn't really have this much government lending. It had been a while. So this has been a long run of FHA, VA loans that really spurred the economy. So I think we definitely need to keep, you know, keep moving on that. Um, if there's any last thoughts, Rob, uh, you know, for um, that you have, you know, any advice before we uh, sign off here? Um, you know, the, <clears throat> the liquidity, uh, or lack of liquidity will stop a company dead in its tracks, whether it's a lack of, uh, money to pay, you know, your rent or your payroll or, uh, warehouse lender, you know, back to back up warehouse lines. And so, Companies who are very nimble right now are focused on making sure they have the liquidity to help their, their workforce and help their borrowers. Uh, a lot of companies were hit by margin calls uh, a week or two ago. I mean, millions and millions of dollars because of the way the market moved and the hedges and so forth. And um, so they got hit by margin calls and that chews up those, those margin calls chewed up a lot of cash in a hurry. Now they've gotten that back. Uh, because securities have settled um, and, and they're looking ahead to May settlement. But the good companies that I'm seeing out there are very nimble and very quick to make some very hard decisions, whether it is getting out of jumbo lending, getting out of non-QM lending, let the dust settle. When we start getting more investors coming back into the market for jumbo or non-QM, then we'll go back into it. But you know what? Sorry, loan officers, tough decision. We need to act quickly because we don't want to have you know, five or $10 million worth of jumbo or non-QM loans on our warehouse lines that we can't sell. So yeah. some successful companies have made some tough decisions recently. They're going to have some tough decisions coming up. <clears throat> but I think it's important for originators and your listeners here to remember that liquidity and cash in the bank is so very important and, and it'll continue to be so. So that, that's my parting words. No, that makes sense. And, you know, and, to that, I'll add a little bit, which is even if your company is like, we're not going to do jumbos anymore or it's non QM, and it may be um, that that was a big part of your business, just adjust because there's so much other business that's out there. You don't, that's the, but it's the beautiful thing about it is we don't have to lose any jobs because those products went away. Matter of right. fact, we can gain jobs because the pickup on the other side of the fence is so huge that just switch products, right? You can switch products, learn something new. Go after the market. So, Rob, I appreciate it. And everyone else listening, I really appreciate you guys all tuning in. I hope this was helpful for you. Um, you can always reach out to us again. Listen, we're in Celerate. Uh, we help lenders close more loans. You know, if, you, if you're if you not growing right now, and if you don't have uh, automation, market automation, if you don't have lead management, you're not able to stay in contact with your consumers and really drive that workflow force with like our, our lenders that are doing, um, reach out to us. You can reach out to us at our website, Incelerate.com. You can email me, josh at salary.com, and I can forward you on to some of our sales staff. But we'd love to talk to you and see how we can help you. Rob, always good talking to you, and I appreciate your time. You have a enjoy your enjoy your ride this afternoon, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, take care, Josh. All right, Rob. See you guys.